Kevin Clarkson here. I want to tell you about a great deal for our friends and family of Prophecy in the News. We recently had our Pikes Peak Prophecy Summit. We had an incredible lineup of speakers and guests. The attendees were so excited. We heard many comments this was the best prophecy conference ever. If you didn't make it, not to despair. We're offering live streaming still through August the 17th. And by paying uh, $49.95, you have access to the live stream of all the material in the main room. We had such great speakers. We had a special message from Chuck Missler about the decline of America. We had a message from uh, Bill Federer about the rising Arab Spring. We had messages from Dan Goodwin about the timing and, and the sense of the barley harvest and the Lord's return. Messages from Anthony Patch, a new face, about what's happening uh, really in physics today that shows spiritual reality. Get on board. Get with us. Sign up for live streaming. Call the 800 number on your screen or go to prophecythenews.com. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today at Prophecy in the News. I'm your host, Dr. Kevin Clarkson. We are in a season that is looking at uh, government and elections here in the United States. And so for several uh, times of our teaching here, I've been looking in the book of Daniel. God gave specific prophecies to Daniel that really have to do with the nation of Israel, but also with the pagan governments of the world. And it's amazing how really the scripture is such an authentic testimony of the hand of God. One of the great signs of God's existence and proof of the validity of the Bible is fulfilled prophecies. Now many of us are familiar with that in as far as it points to say the return or excuse me the first coming of Jesus. His birth, his life, his death and resurrection. Most of us have heard many uh, messages and we've seen how Christ fulfilled so many specific prophecies the first time he came. We're also very aware of uh, prophecies about his second coming, which outnumber the prophecies of his first coming, three to one. And so a lot of the focus of this ministry and other good ministries is prophecies that are yet to come. But I think it's fascinating and encouraging and instructive for us even today to look at prophecies that have been fulfilled in time. And certainly, even before the coming of Christ, some of the visions that Daniel saw have a double fulfillment. They were fulfilled actually before the coming of Christ the first time and they're going to have a lateral or a parallel fulfillment toward the end of time. They're very instructive and when you can actually see the movement of the nations and the rise of empires as God forecasted and told that it would happen it's an amazing thing and that does several things for you and I. Number one that bolsters our own faith that ought to give you great confidence as a follower of Jesus and as somebody who wants to speak up and live for him in this day and age just to know the sheer fact that you serve a God that forecasts and predicts the beginning from the end. And God declared as much in scripture when he said, who is like me? Who else is there that declares the beginning from the end? So the Lord is able to show and to tell and in a marvelous way fulfill his word and his promises. And that you see feeds our faith and it makes us strong as we live for him today. But the other thing it does is it gives us confidence as we look for the future. If God was right about all these things in the past and he knows exactly what he plans to do and is able to reveal his secrets to his servants as he declares in Amos, then we can safely rest in the fact that he is going to do exactly what he has said he would do. Which brings us to Daniel's prophecies. Now we are right now uh, in this election season as I mentioned and so if you subscribe to our magazine at Prophecy in the News, I've done two articles in the last couple of months now on Daniel's uh, visions and how they relate to aspects of human government. <coughs> From that aspect, we looked at the particularly human side of it and how government actually, even though it's ordained of God, is never perfect and always comes up short and also really tends toward corruption. None of the, these things should surprise the people of God because we're aware of human nature and the tendency for sin and evil and we see it played out before our eyes. If you want to know more about those, I urge you to check out those articles. And if you don't subscribe to our magazine at Prophecy in the News, let me urge you to check into that. You can call the 800 number of our ministry, which will be on your screen, or go to our website, prophecyinthenews.com, and a year subscription of 12 issues is $34.95, and that includes shipping and handling. If you get the printed edition, you get a bonus uh, book selection with it, a book or DVD resource, and check out that special offer. That's free and thrown in 
You can get a digital edition. There's no bonus feature, but you can get the digital edition and access the magazine every month on your laptop or your uh, iPad or however you choose to do that on your phone, and it's $24.95 a year. But check that out, and, and you'll find uh, a lot of good reading there, not just articles by myself, but we have regular contributors every month who really bring some of the best teaching in uh, the prophetic world today to bear on this. Well, as we've looked at these uh, same passages from another aspect, we've seen the spiritual side. Now, I wrote about the human side of government, but we've actually seen the spiritual side in, in these broadcasts as we've looked into images that Daniel was given. And just to paint the big picture with you and review very quickly, uh, Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 2 was given a vision of a statue, and it went from glittering gold to silver to brass to iron. And what we saw with that was the successive empires that had to do with the nation of Israel during the lifetime of Daniel himself. And so he had to deal with the Babylonian Empire, then the Persian Empire, and then Daniel did die, but after that came Greece, and after that would be Rome. So those four empires were in the image of Nebuchadnezzar. Then when we turn to Daniel chapter 7, the uh, statue was in chapter 2, in Daniel 7, Daniel himself has a terrifying night vision, and he doesn't see a glittering, beautiful statue, but he sees a series of dreadful, fearful, horrible beasts. And right there's an insight. Man almost worships, you know, his government, his institutions, his social programs. Man believes that he can create a utopia, even though it stands on feet of clay, as Nebuchadnezzar's vision found out. Man has this high, exalted view of what he can do. But Daniel saw from heaven's view what it really looks like. Government is like a ravenous beast. And it will tear, it will devour, it will oppress, it will crush. If God is not included and God is not acknowledged, that is the very real evil of government. And especially in the last century, the 20th century, where you saw governments without God, governments that specifically denounced God, we would be talking about uh, Soviet communism. We would be talking about the Chinese communism. We would be talking about Cambodia, North Korea today. Specifically in those empires, you actually see a killing of the own citizens on a massive scale, unmatched in human history. Millions, millions of citizens tortured, imprisoned, liquidated, eliminated by the government, all for the supposed greater cause. Even Nazism, though they acknowledged God and had a, a nominal claim to Christianity, the actual leaders of uh, Nazi Germany, including and led by Hitler, were actually involved in occultic pagan worship practices, and they certainly did not acknowledge the God of Scripture. Their God was Lucifer. And, of course, the thief, Satan, has come to steal and kill and to destroy. Well, what we're looking at now <coughs> is Daniel's teaching on this succession of empires and I specifically look with you in Daniel 10 whereas Daniel was praying about the fate of the nation of Israel the time had come as he read Jeremiah's prophecy for them to return from exile it had been 70 years and as this man of God fasted and prayed for three weeks he waited he waited on heaven and he waited with diligence and he waited uh, with passion and he waited intensely he didn't occupy himself with a lot of other things in those three weeks when you're fasting, you're really focused. And as Daniel did this three-week fast, finally on the 21st day, an answer comes. A messenger from heaven arrives and gives Daniel some incredible information about how God's going to restore the Jews, how he's going to send the Messiah, how the Messiah will be cut off, and then how God will ultimately fulfill all of his promises and bring an end and bring ushering in righteousness and really the coming Messiah. So it's a beautiful prophecy. And yet what we find as we look behind the curtain is the angel said, Daniel, on the day you first asked, I came, but I was resisted. There was war in the heavenlies. I was opposed by the prince of Persia. And that particular uh, reference of Daniel is a reference to principalities and powers. Those of you who know the New Testament and spiritual warfare will know that the Bible tells us in Ephesians 6 that our battle is not against flesh and blood. You know, in America, we can get all worked up about this party or that party, the Republicans, the Democrats, the independents, the Greens, whatever. But you must understand, as corrupt as humans and politicians can be, the real battle 
is against Satan and the hordes of hell. And you must understand, as Daniel pulls the curtain back, that there are territorial satanic spirits that are assigned to government headquarters and centers. And those that are spiritually sensitive have, a, have actually told me, and myself in certain settings, they've actually sensed and almost felt the oppression of those spirits when they would go into certain regions where either uh, there was a strong evil culture, as in areas of Los, An Las Vegas or Los Angeles, where pornography is so prevalent, or Las Vegas where gambling and uh, crime is prevalent, or in Washington, D.C., like a government power center. So these spirits are there, and what, what we see in Daniel is the curtain was pulled back. What I chose to do with you at that point was to review the succession of empires in this world that have specifically had to do with the nation of Israel. The Lord said in Zechariah, whoever touches Israel touches the apple of my eye. The apple of the eye is an expression for the pupil. It's the most sensitive part of your eye. Your eye sensitive if you get a little, little grain of sand in there or a piece of dust. You know how irritated your eye can get. But if it's on the pupil, there's the danger that it'll scratch the cornea and impair your vision. And it's a very, very sensitive part of you. And God says, I'm so attuned to Israel that when anyone threatens or touches them, I'm instantly aware. So we looked at the nations that touched Israel throughout our history. And in light of Bible prophecy and teaching and history, and we saw really the if you will the characteristics of these spirits these warfare spirits with whom you and i have to do now, just a review and then we'll look at the the main one today greece but by way of review we looked at egypt it's a spirit of slavery and bondage we talked about that spirit in america today there are people with chemical alcohol sexual all manner of addictions in their lives that are running them and holding them in bondage and ultimately taking them down we talked about the financial slavery and bondage that is so much a part of our culture and how people live by credit and uh, really with money that they don't have. So we looked at that, the, 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 the really spirit of slavery. Then we looked at Assyria, and it was actually a spirit of division in that kingdom that saw Israel divide into the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. And we talked today how there's a spirit of division in our land and how really Satan is trying to turn us against one another in our nation. This is happening in Europe as well. But, you know, people think that they're wrestling against flesh and blood and don't realize that the real enemy is lurking behind it, laughing at us as he gets us to tear and devour one another. Then we spoke about the spirit of Babylon. That's a spirit of rebellion. That's actually a spirit that rises up and rebels in a strong way against God. And, uh, you know, as it says in 1 Samuel 15, 23, the spirit of rebellion is as witchcraft or rebellion is as the spirit of witchcraft. And really, there's an occultic spirit behind that rebellion. And the spirit of Babylon is very much uh, in evidence in our land as we see anti-authority anti measures as people are rising up against law enforcement, as people are distrusting institutions, and as we see really uh, occult worship and rituals happening in our country today. God judged that by sending a confusion, and that's certainly present in our land. And then we're to the fourth one, and we looked uh, last time at Persia, or Medo-Persia, if you will. That is really a spirit of hatred of Jews, and it really is there in the book of Esther. All of these things we find in Scripture. But the hatred of the Jews, the Persians helped Israel get back to the land under Cyrus, and so they looked like they were helping, but within just a few generations, an evil man, an ancient foe of Israel, really, because Haman was who God used the human person and he's called the Agagite and he's related to Agag who was an Amalekite the ancient foe of Israel and there's this ancient hatred of Israel that is manifest in our world today there's a strong anti-semitism and persecution and oppression and blame of the Jews for the problems of the world and society and this was very much in play in Nazi Germany it's very much in play in Europe today especially in France and other places but it's most strong today in France and it's it's rising again in Germany and so this spirit is in, in, in play in our world today, this hatred of the Jews. We come now to what be, may be the most disguised spirit of all. That is, you might least uh, associate it with Satan, and yet it seems to be a master stroke. And that is the spirit of the empire of Greece. And that's what we want to talk about for the next several moments. If you'll look with me in the book of Daniel, chapter 8, 
Daniel had a vision, which we read last time, of a combat scene that happened between a strong ram and a male goat. And the ram was winning. It was going every direction and being uh, victorious in all of its fights. And suddenly, it just appeared, this male goat, and it ran with such astonishing speed and force that it seemed like it wasn't even touching the ground as it ran. And it ran into that ram and just shattered the ram's horn, and the ram fell wounded. Well, the Bible explains that in Daniel chapter 8, verse 19. As the messenger from heaven says to Daniel, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. Again, the Medo-Persian Empire. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. And that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation but not in his power. Now, these things came to pass specifically uh, after Daniel was long gone. Uh, The Medo-Persian Empire waxed great. It conquered much of the world. And then in time, uh, Alexander the Great of Greece came. His father was Philip of Macedon, who built an empire. But Philip died uh, rather young himself. And his young son, Alexander, took the reins of power and took over the army of Greece and Alexander is regarded by historians as one of the most ambitious human beings who has ever lived he just had his eyes on the ends of the world and as far as the horizon could be seen and he was determined to go and conquer and so he developed uh, astonishing speed the ferocity with which he would attack he would uh, move and, and it was described as lightning quick and his conquest mounted very quickly and everybody was afraid of Greece and Legend has it that when he went all the way to the Indus River, Alexander sat down and wept because there was no more world to conquer. Um, He died before he turned 30. We want to talk about Alexander and the spirit behind him. It's really what I would call a spirit of humanism. And that's why I say it so deadly. You don't think of associating it with Satan. It was the Greeks who exalted man. It was the Greeks who lifted up man. It was the Greeks who said that man is really the ultimate thing on this earth, the highest of all in their denial of God. And really it was a return (coughs) to the lie in the Garden of Eden where Satan the serpent had appealed to the first couple and when he tempted Eve, he said, if you eat of this forbidden fruit, you shall be as gods. There's always been that desire of man to want to be godlike. Humanism is the ultimate expression of that And the ultimate expression of humanism will finally and fully come in the Antichrist who will consider himself the complete and perfect man, not realizing that he's called the man of iniquity, uh, the son of perdition, because uh, Satan's best is God's worst. What an amazing thing as we think about humanism today. You know, humanism began to infect America early on. It came out of some teaching in the Enlightenment in Europe and it rose through the, the time of the 1800s and into the 1900s. There was the arrival of Darwinism in, in England in 1859 with the publication of Origin of the Species. And there began to be a supposed rational explanation for a universe and a world without God. And so man turned, and it used to be a rather embarrassing thing to be an atheist, but now it was intellectually sophisticated to have an explanation of natural causes and as uh, Christianity was sort of thrown over the shoulder and left in a, in a heap behind, progress marched forward. In fact, critics of the Bible began to arise. Even within the church and Christianity, biblical so-called criticism, higher critics arose, and they began to tear apart the Bible and attack the miracles and the supernatural aspects. And when they were done, these supposed friends of Christianity, the Bible was left in shreds and tatters as if it were just a human book of myths and stories And of course, that's all a lie because this is the inspired, infallible word of God. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall last forever. As this spirit of humanism rose, man began to believe why we can do whatever we want. We really will be as gods. And as the builders of Babel, they said, we'll build a tower and make a name for ourselves. And so this tower of intellectualism and pride and hubris began to be built in a great and incredible way. And uh, it really reached a, uh, a force in the early part of the 20th century. 
And it came over the shores of uh, the Atlantic to America and embedded in our seminaries. And seminaries that once taught the word of God became infected with liberalism. And so we had the whole uh, rising of denominations turning away from their historic faith and being infected with a weak, uh, flaccid faith that couldn't really hold to any truth at all and didn't stand for anything. Many mainline churches are still that way today, tragically. Those who believed to the Bible and clung to the Bible, they were ridiculed and marginalized. And uh, there we still find ourselves today in many aspects in our society. The spirit of humanism reached a real forte, even though Greece is that spirit. When Rome conquered Greece, which we'll talk about next time because it's the final and most terrifying beast of all. When Rome conquered Greece, they, they kept what was good. And they saw this humanism as a good thing. In fact, the Romans thought, well, we can make an art form out of that. We can just take that to a whole new level. And so when we really go to the New Testament, we find an explanation for humanism. And it's in the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Romans. In Romans chapter 1, I'd just like to visit uh, three or four verses with you there because they really explain what I would call the heart of humanism that deifies man and denies God. Romans chapter 1, verse 21, speaks of humans. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So people aware of God, because Romans uh, verses 19 through 21, explain that you can see the invisible God through what he's created. You can see the invisible through what is visible. The maker through what is made. The creator you see through the creation. But people have a choice. And so they chose to deny that and they weren't thankful and they became at that point vain. They became proud, lifted up with themselves and their foolish heart became darkened. This is the tragedy and it's across our universities today. Harvard itself, the great university in, uh, in, in uh, Boston, was founded to train ministers for religious leadership. It was founded with a seminary and its, its motto was truth. And uh, over time, it's totally turned that upside down and departed from its historic roots. Today, Harvard uh, really doesn't have much use for God at all. And uh, there's a denial of him in most of their departments. And they're producing a real, um, a real just whole stream, if you will, of uh, liberal and God-denying graduates who go out to become leaders in the world it's a it's a very tragic thing well God says when you turn away from him your your heart and your mind are going to be darkened and I want to read on in verse 22 this is what's ironic professing themselves to be wise they became fools it's almost like the emperor with new clothes with no clothes as the emperor struts around thinking he's wearing these fashionable garments and only the wise can see them he doesn't realize that he's stark naked and everybody is laughing, but anybody's too ashamed to say, don't you see what's going on? And that's exactly how man without God carries forward. He thinks he's so smart. He thinks he can find a way to eternal life uh, through scientific manipulation and genetic uh, enhancement. He thinks that he's going to improve the species. Humanity 2.0. Professing themselves wise, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. And so you see these statues and they go in a progression or a degression downward because the first one is of a man and then maybe of a bird and then an animal and then a creeping thing like a reptile or a snake. When you go to the very darkest regions of the world where missions have have gone whether it be in Africa or India uh, places that had gone centuries without the gospel there was almost a universal worship of the serpent and it, it's 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 a little bit hair raising when you start to think about that and where that would have come from Satan of course entered the garden as a serpent and he was walking and on uh, all fours but God cursed him and he slithered out and uh, the lowest common denominator of worship is of a serpent but the highest at least as man tries to do his own thing is to make an image of man now immediately when i say ancient greece you see marble and white statues in your mind and they're statues of humans 
There's no body shaming because all of the uh, specimens are perfect. Perfectly proportioned, muscular, shapely, fit. We've got all this worship of man. And that's really the spirit of humanism. Behind humanism is really a naturalism. There is no God. We'll explain everything without him. There is what I would just call amoralism. There is no morality, situational ethics. Everything is relative to the situation. And uh, just like Satan said, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. If you'll substitute the word right and wrong for good and evil there, you'll get the idea. We get to be our own rule makers in humanism. And therefore, in the wake of humanism, which is, again, I said infected our culture now for almost 90 years, you have uh, abortion on demand. You have arguments for euthanasia. You have arguments for open marriage or no marriage, uh, open promiscuity. Now we're redefining gender and as to what male and female is. And as we go to this taping, there's actually a case in uh, one of our states right now where a local school district has forbade the teachers to use the words boy and girl because it will confuse the students. That is upside down. That's confusing to me. Well, again, I want to remind you, if you're in that district, get to the school board meetings. Run for office. Fight and make a difference. But I want to say this. Remember, our battle is not against flesh and blood. Behind humanism is a satanic spiritual principality and force. And we need to recognize that. As we come to kind of wrap up with this today, I want you to think about something. Man without God can never rise as high as he thinks. He will fall. And he will fall lower than he ever imagined. Because man was made to know God and to glorify God, to honor God and serve God. And when you go from that, you go in the exact opposite direction and you end up becoming a shadow of yourself, a character, caricature, a cartoon of what man was meant to be. And that's the destruction that sin has brought and that's the lie that many have bought and that's what's brought such uh, sorrow and pathologies into our society today. The only answer and the only cure is to know him the God who is, who came as the perfect man, the only real man since Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus, because you couldn't, went in your place and gave his life on the cross. He was buried and rose again, King of kings and Lord of lords. This same Bible says he's coming back to claim what's his. And when he comes back, you want to be his. So if you've never done it, call on his name today. Trust him. Ask him to save you. And we'll keep looking up.